Good morning, church. Welcome to The Orchard. If you're joining us today as a guest, a special welcome to you. As you may know, this is the beginning of Holy Week. Today is Palm Sunday. We remember Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Our King came to shed His own blood for those who had rebelled against Him. As we prepare for next weekend, Good Friday and Easter, let's remember that one who was first became last for us. Please stand, join us as we engage in a responsive reading from Revelation 7. After this, I looked, and there was a vast multitude from every nation, tribe, people, and language, which no one could number, standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes with palm branches in their hands, and they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God, who is seated on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels stood around the throne, and along with the elders and the four living creatures, they fell face down before the throne and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Every sinner, every 
Thank you. 
song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. How
church, please be seated. Good morning, church family. My name is Pastor Luke. I'm pastor of Congregational Life, and uh, it's an honor to uh, lead you in prayer this morning. Please bow your heads in humility and in deference as we approach the Lord. For we know that some 2,000 years ago, the week before the resurrection, Easter Sunday, the words of Zechariah the prophet came true as God revealed himself in Jesus Christ. On this day, this weekend in history, Jesus entered Jerusalem. The king entered his city. The people shouted, Hosanna. That is a joyful praise for God's glory, revealed in his Messiah, revealed in Jesus Christ. The son of David entered into the city of David. Zechariah notes that the prisoners, the captives, are set free through the blood of the covenant. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. The Messiah did not enter Jerusalem on a war horse. Jesus did not choose a war horse. Rather, he approached the city. He approached God's people with humility. Our creator, sustainer, our redeemer arrived on a donkey. Humbly, he calls us to follow him. He sups with his disciples. He washes their feet. He saves and he sanctifies. He is not riding a war horse, for his mission is reconciliation. He brings peace. Jesus does not declare war on us. Rather, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. The good news is given to us. For our sake he was made for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Lord, we approach you in gratitude. You are our king. We belong to you. We are part of your kingdom. Lord, we are your kingdom. Thank you for the forgiveness of sins. Thank you, you have adopted us into your family. You reconciled us with yourself. You have gifted us with the Holy Spirit. You have freed us from the tyranny of sin. We have fellowship in the church, your people. We have the resurrection from the dead, the glorification of our bodies, the new heaven and the new earth, eternity in your safe presence. We have a relationship with Jesus Christ, as your word says, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Now, Lord, open our hearts that your word may be implanted within us. You speak to us through our reading and now the preaching of your word. As you have entered into our lives, we too are called into your life. You call us to be ministers, representatives, a nation of priests, ambassadors. You enable us edify and empower us to live for you and to be part of your ministry of reconciliation. Through your word and spirit, we become an extension of your love. Each time your word is preached, your word guides us to you and calls us to live for you. Speak to us now that we may reflect and respond in ways that bring you glory. Your word is life. And your word creates new life within us. Your indwelling presence manifests in and through your redemptive purposes. Our king calls us to participate in his kingdom. We thank you and we pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Beloved, two things I want to draw your attention to. Uh, As we approach Easter, we have Good Friday. Uh, This Friday is, and we have three services. It's going to be 3 o'clock, 4.30, and 6. 
We have childcare at the 3 o'clock and 4.30 from uh, birth to kindergarten. We have service on Saturday, and then Sunday morning is going to be three services as well, 8 a.m., 9.30, and 11 a.m. And we'll have child care during the first service at 8 a.m. It's going to be birth to kindergarten. At the 9.30 service, it's going to be birth through fifth grade. And then at the 11 o'clock service, it's going to be uh, birth to 12th grade. So we got you covered. Sound good? All right. I want to remind you, this is, we're going to continue worshiping here, and this is a great time to fill out your connection cards, and also a big thanks for your giving. Uh, we are grateful to be a part of such a, a faithful and giving congregation. I just want to also give a reminder that our fiscal year ends April 30th. Thanks. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God, how great. standing for the reading of God's word. Our reading today is Exodus chapter 4, verse 18 and 23. Exodus chapter 4, verse 18 and 23. If you pick up on the Bible on the way in, you will find that on the page 47. Exodus chapter 4, verse 18 and 23. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses in Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff on God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracle that I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, 
Israel is my firstborn son, and I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. This God's word, you may be seated. Well, church, early in our marriage, my wife Carrie and I went to California to visit her extended family, and while we were there, her uncle Gary took me to a popular spot for surfing uh, on the California coast. Now, I wasn't going to go surfing, uh, because I definitely was not ready for that, but I was going to try to catch some waves on one of those, you know, boogie boards you kind of lay on. So, I was looking forward to that, but before I got into the ocean, Uncle Gary wanted to really be sure that I understood the power of the surf that I was just about to encounter. Now, this was a good call on his part because up to that point in my life was really only familiar with Lake Michigan waves, which which can be powerful, (laughs) but the waves of the Pacific Ocean, especially at a place known for surfing where the, the tides, the currents, the strengths of the waters are really cranking, That is a different story than anything I'd ever experienced on Lake Michigan. And so Uncle Gary, again, wanted to be really sure I understood that, yes, hopefully today there would be some joy in riding the waves on my boogie board, but there would also be tremendous danger for me if I fought the waves. Because really, no matter how good of a swimmer I was, you just can't win against the power of the waves. And that's just what I found out that day. Uh, catching a wave the couple times I did was absolutely exhilarating. But one moment when I got thrown to the beach like a rag doll, when I, I wasn't operating with the waves but against them, boy, that was painful. I just got tossed to the beach. Now, I share this because this is actually the kind of thing we've been discussing and, and learning in our study of the book of Exodus over these past few weeks. We've discovered that the will of our God is actually a whole lot like these waves. There are thrilling victories when you keep in step with God's will, but it is ultimately useless to fight against it. Now, this point really gets pressed home here in our last message from the book of Exodus, or I should say our last message for now. I think we're going to pick up again in Exodus at some point uh, later on uh, this year. But the four scenes that comprise the true story we're studying today, what they're going to do is they're going to teach us here in Exodus 4, four vital lessons about the will of our God. So please do have your Bibles open, as always, with me this morning to Exodus 4, verses 18 to 31. And the first scene in this true story, the first scene in our passage teaches us this. God uses whomever he wills. Now, like I just mentioned, the book of Exodus has already been teaching us this lesson. Uh, In case you weren't here, no worries. Let's do some review. Back in chapter 2, a baby named Moses was born. And he should have never, ever made it to even his first birthday. Because he was born to Israelite parents Uh, in a day when the nation of Israel were were slaves in the land of Egypt, at a time when the king of Egypt, the man called the Pharaoh, was busy killing all the Hebrew baby boys. So Moses should have never made it to his first birthday, but God's will is to one day use Moses to deliver him from uh, and his people from that very slavery. And so because God's will is to use Moses, Pharaoh's plan does not succeed. Moses lives. But then when Moses grows up, he learns of God's rescue plan to deliver the people of Israel from slavery. In fact, God speaks to him in great detail about the role he'll play in this plan in chapter 3 when God appears and speaks to Moses in a burning bush. Now, you, you might think that Moses' heart and mind would be thrilled at the prospect of being this hero who marches into Egypt to deliver God's people, to have the privilege of hearing God speak to him from a burning bush. You might think Moses would be excited at the prospect of playing such a key role in the will of God. But instead, throughout Exodus 3 and 4, Moses just worries and complains. But God doesn't turn his back on Moses. Rather, he gives Moses, though Moses... He's very weak. He he gives Moses everything that Moses needs to carry out the rescue plan. 
God's will is to use Moses. So God is going to use Moses. And that brings us to today's passage and specifically to verses 18 to 20. And as we think about these verses, remember what I just said. Moses should be dead already. And Moses has been beset with worries and complaints. And yet what we find here in scene one uh, in scripture is that Moses is now up and on his way to do God's will. Uh, Verse 18, he respectfully asks his father-in-law for permission to go back to Egypt. Uh, Pretty good move, right? To get your father-in-law's permission when you want to do something. I like that. Uh, You know, not only that, he'd been employed by his uh, father-in-law as a shepherd. And so he needs to kind of turn the flocks back over to the family business. So good move by Moses. Then verse 19, God keeps encouraging him that he's going to go. He's going to make it. He's not going to die. And so verse 20, in light of all that's happened, Moses packs up his wife and two sons and goes to Egypt. Now, really let that sink in. Moses has been filled with worries and complaints about returning to Egypt to deliver Israel from slavery to Pharaoh. But now he's not just going himself. He's taken his whole family along with him on a dangerous rescue mission. So truly, again, we say God uses whomever he wills. He can even make a scared man courageous enough to bring his whole family with him to carry out a risky rescue plan. Uh, And I dare say, too, that we can see the same principle at work in the last line of verse 20, in the staff of God that Moses takes in his hand as he goes. Now, to remind you of what we learned a couple weeks ago, God worked a miracle with this shepherd's staff. In in front of Moses' own eyes, God turned this shepherd's staff into a snake and back again. And remember, God did that with merely a stick of wood. And if God can do this with a stick of wood, turning it into a snake and back, again, I think we can truly say that God uses whomever and whatever he wills for his purposes. Now, I really like what a Christian preacher by the name of Francis Schaeffer said many years ago about this stick of wood. He said, consider the mighty ways in which God used a dead stick of wood. God so used a stick of wood can be a banner cry for each of us. Though we are limited and weak in talent, physical energy, and psychological strength, we are not less than a stick of wood. And church, that's where there's a whole lot of encouragement for us here in scene one. Too often, like Moses, we get stuck in our worries and complaints We're held back by how weak we think we are. Well, I'm not smart enough to share my faith. I'm not strong enough to make an impact for Jesus. But we are not less than a stick of wood. (laughs) And God can use even a dead stick of wood. So if God's will is to deploy us for his power and glory and service, then he will use us. So next time you're feeling weak, look in the mirror and say to yourself, God can use a stick of wood so he can use me. All right. Now, as much as this is encouraging, there's also conviction to be had here. You know, Pastor Trey talked last week about the prophet Jonah, a prophet who didn't want to serve God, a prophet who tried not to serve God, a prophet who in fact ran away from God. And Moses has really done a lot the same in chapters three and four. He's tried to get himself off the hook from this plan. As he says in chapter 4, verse 13, Oh my Lord, please send someone else. But the waves of God's will are far stronger than what Moses or Jonah can swim against. And so Jonah goes to Nineveh and Moses goes to Egypt. Now I wonder if maybe you can relate to this. You know there's someone in your life who needs to hear about Jesus from you, but for whatever reason, you've been resisting. You know there's a way you need to serve God, your church, or your community, but for whatever reason, you've been resisting. Please, brother, sister, see in the scriptures today, such resistance is futile. You might as well get up and going Because if it's God's will to use you, he will use you. His waves are way too strong. He uses whomever he wills, including you. So you might as well get up and moving. 
Now that brings us to a second scene in our passage and a scene where we learn that God's will is stronger than his enemy's will. This is a truth that really saturates verses 21 to 23 of chapter 4. And we see it for starters in God's instruction to Moses in verse 21 that he needs to perform for Pharaoh three signs, three signs that were described back at the beginning of chapter 4. And all three of these signs are going to emphatically prove to Pharaoh that God is stronger. Now, in case you weren't with us a couple of weeks ago when we discussed these, or just by way of refresher, if these signs aren't on the top of your mind, uh, let me briefly go over each of these miracles that God tells and enables Moses to perform. So first, Moses, like, like we were just talking about, Moses is to turn his shepherd's staff into a snake and back again. And since snakes were the royal sign of the Egyptian uh, royal family in those days, Moses' God-given ability to manipulate a snake proves God's power over the Egyptian royal family. And then Moses is also to do a miracle before Pharaoh in which he puts his hand into a cloak and it becomes leprous. And then when he puts his hand into a cloak a second time, the leprosy disappears. And this is fascinating because leprosy plagued Egypt in those days. It was a plague on Pharaoh's people that Pharaoh and his minions had not been able to cure. And, and, and so Moses' God-given ability to eliminate leprosy proves God's power to deal and cure a plague that Pharaoh had not had any success dealing with himself. And then Moses is also to perform a sign in which he takes some water from that famous river in Egypt, the Nile River, and he pours water on the ground and the water turns into blood. And the Nile River in Egyptian religious belief in those days was seen as kind of the creator, as the source of life in Egypt. And so Moses' God-given ability to mess with the waters of the Nile proves God's power over any Egyptian religious beliefs. So again, all three of these signs emphatically prove that God is stronger than Pharaoh. But God takes this expression of the power of his will uh, even a step farther in the second half of verse 21. As if the first half wasn't enough, the second half goes farther where we read that God will harden Pharaoh's heart. Now take that in. What this means is that God's will is literally stronger than Pharaoh's will, so much so that God is actually able to reach into Pharaoh's heart and harden it against him. And thus, as the end of verse 21 explains, rather than being moved by the miracles and letting God's people go, the Pharaoh going, oh man, wow, this God of Israel, he's so great, he's so wonderful. Look at the, look at the powers that he's performing in my midst. I don't want to fight back against him. I better let his people go. Instead of that happening, because his heart is hard, Pharaoh will remain resistant and attempt to keep God's people enslaved for as long as he possibly can. And because of this same hard-heartedness, verses 22 and 23 tell us that God will assert his power and his justice over Pharaoh's firstborn son, just like Pharaoh has gone after God's son, the people of Israel. Now, uh, what I've learned in numerous conversations over the years is that many of us don't like this business of God hardening Pharaoh's heart. It, it seems somehow unfair or unjust to us as if it's not good for God to do such a thing. Or it seems philosophically dissonant to us as if Pharaoh should have a will that's just free to do whatever the Pharaoh pleases, that somehow we need to preserve the freedom of, of Pharaoh's will. And for some of us, these questions have inhibited us from even having faith or have inhibited us from growing in faith. And so I, wa I want to tackle this situation head on with, with three observations that I, I hope will help you out when you read in verse 21 that God hardens Pharaoh's heart. And here's the first one. Please remember, Pharaoh is not innocent. This king of Egypt is not some pure and innocent man 
Nor is he even the kind of man who, who is really trying his best to honor God, but he just has some weaknesses. He just has some imperfections, but he's really trying to do his best. This is not Pharaoh at all. He's just the opposite of this. He is flagrantly sinning in his brutal and vicious enslavement of God's people. And as Exodus chapter 8 verse 15 explains, he hardens his own heart. When he does exert his will, he hardens his own heart against God. So yes, as much as God hardens Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh also hardens his own heart. As one scholar puts it, Pharaoh's heart is doubly hard. He is not innocent. Here's a second observation. Number two, it's good. It is good that God's will is stronger than Pharaoh's. I think oftentimes the primary struggle we have with chapter 4, verse 21, is how a good God can harden someone's heart. But this is actually part of God's goodness. Here's what I mean. If Pharaoh's will cannot be affected by God, then God is not very powerful. If God cannot reach into Pharaoh's heart and cause Pharaoh's heart to do God's bidding, then God is not God. In other words, if we de deny verse 21, then we cannot be confident that God can beat Pharaoh and we cannot be confident that his promises to deliver his people will ever come to pass because if God is not strong enough to affect Pharaoh's will, then how is God ever going to get his people out of Pharaoh's murderous grasp? Here then, upon reflection, is where we begin to realize, or I should say, I hope we begin to realize that we want God to be stronger than his enemies in every way. We need this, actually. If, if God is going to deliver his people from his enemies, we need God to be wholly stronger than his enemies. And so then it's actually good that God is able to harden Pharaoh's heart. It's, it's good that God's will is stronger than Pharaoh's will because this means that our God really is God and that he really does have the power to save his people. And that leads us to a third observation, which is that God is actually glorified by this hardening of Pharaoh's heart. Now, if you keep reading past chapter 4, what you'll discover is that in response to Pharaoh's hardness, God performs miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle. And, and in so doing, his name is exalted in the face of opposition by all these miracles. The light of his glory actually shines brighter against the darkness of opposition. Have you ever uh, been in a really dark room? Maybe you went to the movies in the middle of the day. You had the day off, so you went to a noon movie. You know, it was pitch black in that movie theater, and as soon as you walked into the parking lot, you were like, whoa, why is it so bright, right? <laughs> well, it's so bright because the room you were in was so dark, and so the day seems brighter than ever. Or, or speaking of the movies, how does Batman reveal his heroic nature to the city of Gotham? <laughs> It's because even though the Joker keeps doing nastier and nastier stuff, even though the Joker keeps coming up with more and more and more evil plans, Batman prevails every time. Doesn't matter how evil Joker is, how strong Joker seems to be, Batman is always stronger. And that's why we love Batman. And this is what's happening in Egypt. The hardness of Pharaoh, the way he resists God only ends up revealing just how much more powerful, just how much more glorious our God is. And so when you read that God hardens Pharaoh's heart in verse 21, please remember, Pharaoh is not innocent. It is good that God's will is stronger than his enemy's will. And God is even glorified by the hardening. Now, before we press on to scene three, I don't want you to miss the way that this second scene uh, connects to what we'll celebrate later on this week, Good Friday, the day that Jesus Christ died on the cross for us. Think carefully with me. The corrupt leaders, the corrupt Jewish leaders who saw to the execution of Jesus wanted Jesus dead. That was their will, 
And so when they succeeded in getting him crucified, they thought they were getting their way. They thought their will had won. (laughs) And yet the will of the corrupt Jewish leaders was just a pawn in God's scheme. In reality, their will was merely accomplishing the very will of our God. So that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, should suffer and die for our sins on the cross. You see, truly, Israel's rescue from slavery in Egypt depended on God's will being stronger than the Pharaoh's will. And just as truly, our rescue from slavery to sin depends on God's will being stronger than the will of those who crucified Jesus. Now, church, is there some mystery in this? Yes, absolutely. (laughs) Can I pretend to stand here before you this morning and and say that, that I understand and can explain to you all the intricacies of the way God's will and our will like intersects and just meshes perfectly? No, I I can't pretend to explain all that. Again, because there's some mystery here. But here's what we can say. Here's what scripture does allow us to gladly say. God's will is stronger than his enemies, and thank the Lord for that. And with that, we come to a third lesson on God's will, and it's that God's will is for our sanctification. This is scene three. And and really, as if scene two wasn't difficult enough to understand, (laughs) here comes scene three, all right? Verse 24. Verse 24 tells us, That just as Moses encountered the Lord in the wilderness, so he now encounters the Lord once again on the road to Egypt. But instead of speaking to Moses from a burning bush like last time, this time, in this encounter, the Lord seeks to put Moses to death. Now scholars really aren't sure what to make of what kind of event took place here. Uh, Maybe God made Moses very sick. Maybe God wrestled with Moses akin to the way that God had once wrestled with Jacob. Uh, Maybe uh, Moses encountered an angel of the Lord who was an ambassador of God's power. Maybe it was something else entirely that really the the text doesn't give us many clues. Um, But as much as there's confusion about what kind of event took place in these verses... Verses 25 and 26 give us a vital clue that will make clear why the events of verse 24 took place. Because Zipporah, Moses' wife, seems to immediately understand why the Lord is seeking to put Moses to death. She seems to put the pieces together immediately. And in response, she quickly circumcises her son. And and once she does, we read in verse 26 that the Lord leaves Moses alone. So take that in. The Lord, verse 24, is trying to put Moses to death. So verse 25, Zipporah, Moses' wife, circumcises their son. And so verse 26, problem solved. (laughs) Why on earth does circumcision solve the problem? Here's the deal. In the days of Moses, circumcision was the outward sign of the covenant of steadfast love and salvation that God has made with his people. Now, the New Testament will clarify that things don't work quite the same way in in our day to day. There's some parallels, but it's not dependent quite on the physical act of circumcision. But in the days of Moses, Old Testament days, circumcision was the outward sign of the covenant of steadfast love and salvation that God had made with his people. And therefore, every little Hebrew boy had to get circumcised. And God took this sign of the covenant very, very seriously. Uh, Listen to what he said to that wonderful patriarch of Israel, Father Abraham, uh, about this over in Genesis 17, 14. These are God's word. God said to Abraham, Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. So let's put the pieces together here. Another moment today where we really have to think precisely. Why is God sending Moses to Egypt? It's because of the covenant. 
God has made a covenant of steadfast love and salvation with his people so he cannot leave them enslaved. To keep the covenant, God must rescue his people. And so God sends Moses to Egypt because of the covenant. And yet, clearly, based on the evidence of verse 25, Moses himself has not obeyed the covenant. He has not even circumcised his little boy. A faithful scholar by the name of A.W. Pink writes about this. Not until this had been attended to was Moses qualified for his mission. There must be faithfulness in the sphere of his own responsibility before God would go on to make him the channel of divine power. In other words, how is Moses going to be an agent of the covenant until he himself obeys the covenant? And so when we grasp this, the events of scene three really now become uh, clear. They come into focus. Moses knew he needed to circumcise his son, but up to this point, he had not. And since Moses hadn't yet obeyed the still small voice of God, so to speak, God will correct Moses in a much stronger way to bring him back into obedience. So clearly, God's will for Moses' life and for Moses as a leader was obedience, holiness, and purity, or as the Bible often calls it, sanctification. And the Testament makes it clear that this is just as much God's will for us as it was for Moses. Listen to the simple yet striking words of 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 3. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Scripture can't state it any more plainly than that, right? Any more clearly than that. This is the will of God, your sanctification. Now, we all have questions about God's will for our lives. I have questions. You have questions. We've all asked questions. What is God's will for me? Where should I go to college? Uh, who should I marry? When should we try for a family? Should I change careers? When is it time for me to retire? What should I do with my money? All these are the kinds of questions we tend to ask when we wonder, what's God's will for my life? But here's something we never, ever have to question about God's will. God's will for us is our sanctification. God's will is that we grow in obedience, holiness, and purity. God's will is that we be more and more conformed to the image of his son, our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. God's will is that we keep in step with the Holy Spirit day by day. And so while Moses' experience in scene three is admittedly unique, the principle behind it is not. God's will is our sanctification, so he will not let us wallow in disobedience for long. And, and so then, if we refuse to listen to his gentle rebukes, he will issue sterner ones. He will get our attention one way or another. But church, please know that this behavior from God is a kindness. I would be a cruel parent if I did not warn my children of sin. If I saw my child running headlong into self-destruction through sin and temptation, it would be utterly cruel of me if I did not admonish my son or my daughter. And likewise, it would be cruel of God if he didn't warn us against the sin which destroys and harms and rots our souls. It would be cruel of him if he didn't rebuke and expose our sinfulness when we've wallowed in it for too long. And not only that, it's the life of Moses that gives us more proof that God's will for our sanctification is a kindness. Because why is God sanctifying Moses? He's sanctifying Moses to use Moses. So like Moses, God wills sanctification for us so that we're protected from temptation, rescued from disobedience, qualified for his mission in our lives, and ready to be channels of his divine power to the world around us. But here's where I would exhort you. As much as this is a kindness, here's where I would exhort you. 
please don't wait for the kind of stern rebuke that Moses got. Please don't live a life where you only listen to God if he severely rebukes you. Please be more sensitive to his voice than that. Psalm 32 talks about this. It says, please don't be like a horse or a mule, which can only be controlled by bit and bridle. <laughs> In other words, it's saying, you know, if, if you've got a good horse, he'll just follow your lead, right? But if you've got a rowdy horse, you've got to stick a wedge in his mouth and put a brace around his face and force him to come with you. And God loves you enough that he'll get you on the track to holiness. But Psalms 32 is reminding us you can choose two ways. You can simply just listen to his voice through the word, through good friends, through your life group. You can listen to the wisdom of God's word and God's people and just follow his voice and or you can kick against the goads and you'll get a muzzle put on you and dragged along. But God loves you too much to let you wallow in disobedience. So, so please just choose the happier life where you don't wait for him to be severe with you before you pursue holiness. And, and, and here's really how you can do that most of all. Of course, listen to the scriptures as a whole. Listen to wise counsel from people in your life group and the like. But but here's really one of the best ways to make sure you've got a sensitive heart that doesn't need a severe rebuke. Look to the cross, church. Look to the cross. Because when you look at the cross, you see just how seriously God takes your sin. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bled and died for you. And also, when you look to the cross, you see how seriously God wills your sanctification. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, bled and died so that you might be washed of your sins by his blood. And when you look to the cross, you also see how much God loves you. Because Jesus Christ, the Son of God, loved you so much that he bled and died for you. So please don't wait for God to be severe with you. Rather, look to the severity that Jesus endured at Calvary for you and me. And with that, we arrive at the fourth scene of today's passage where we see that God's will always comes to pass. This last scene in chapter 4, verses 27 to 31, is filled with promises kept. Now, I know it doesn't say the words promises kept, here in this part of the passage, but that's exactly what's happening here. Because earlier in chapter four, when Moses felt weak, God promised that he'd give Moses his brother Aaron as a willing partner in the rescue mission. And in verses 27 to 29, promise kept. Aaron arrives and Aaron is a willing partner in the rescue mission. And then also earlier in chapter four, God promises that Moses will be able to do these miraculous signs when he gets to Egypt to help the Pharaoh uh, and to help uh, his interactions with Pharaoh and to help Israel believe in him. And sure enough, when Moses gets to Egypt, verse 30, he and Aaron in partnership are able to do these signs just as God promised. And then further, one of Moses' main worries is that Israel won't believe him when he shows up. And so in chapter 3, verse 18, God promises Moses, when you get to Egypt, Israel's going to believe you. In verse 31, here in chapter 4, that's exactly what happens. Moses shows up to Egypt and Israel listens to his voice. And so this is perhaps one of the happiest lessons we could ever learn about God's will. He keeps his promises to us. His will always comes to pass. And this is happy not just for Moses, but for us, because God has promised to forgive us of our sins if we confess our sins. And through Good Friday, through the cross of Jesus, God has kept that promise to us. And God has also promised to give us victory over death and eternal life in heaven if we call out to Jesus for salvation in faith. And through Easter, through the resurrection of Christ from the dead, in him beating the powers of death, God has kept that promise of eternal life to us. And the very last line of chapter 4 teaches us how to respond to a God such as this. Because when the people of Israel begin to grasp that God has kept his covenant of steadfast love and salvation, that God has sent Moses and Aaron to keep his promises, what do they do? Look at the last line, verse 31. They bow their heads and worship. And church, may we respond 
to God in precisely the same way. Rather than resisting God's will for our lives, let us serve him eagerly. Rather than complaining about his sovereign power, let us rejoice in it. Rather than wallowing in our sins, let us pursue holiness. Let us offer him the whole of our lives in worship. All our heart, all our soul, all our mind, all our strength. Let us worship our faithful, promise-keeping God. Because of what a joy it is to serve a God whose will always comes to pass. Let's pray together. Almighty Father, it is my prayer for us in light of your word today that we would take you at your word. Lord, if that's in a matter of faith and and coming to Christ for the very first time and we we, we feel the, the worry of what other people will think, will think now that we'll become a Christian, or we feel the worry of, of giving up our sin. Lord, may we know that taking you at your word is, is better. Lord, maybe there's a task before us that, that feels too big. We feel the same kind of weakness and worries that, that Moses did. And Lord, let us take you at your word today too, so that we might get up on our feet and get going. Lord, maybe there's a a sin that's lingered in our lives and we kind of like it there. We kind of like what it gives us or so we think or we know how much it robs us of joy and, and happiness in your name and yet we keep giving in, Lord. Help us to take you at your word that sanctification, that holiness is is better than sin. Lord, we we admit that sometimes we have a hard time doing this, but Lord, we, we see in your scriptures that it really is better to trust you, to believe you, to obey you. So yes, God, this is our prayer this morning. May we be a people who take you at your word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Church, please stand. Join us as we respond in worship.
Beloved, I want to close our time today with uh, these words from the Apostle Paul. And I would also encourage you as we're approaching Easter to put a little extra time here into God's word, into prayer, into worship, so that we might be in agreement with Paul here as he says, Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Brothers and sisters, have a great week in the Lord. I will see you this Friday, this good Friday. Amen.